And good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Perf Web. I'm your host, Joe Basha. First, I want to thank all of you, just like I say every week. You know, this is Perf Web number nine, but you guys have made Perf Web your number one edu education hub, and I want to thank you all very much for that. Let me remind you that our webinars are approved for Category 1 CEUs by the ABCP. Please refer to our website, www.perfweb.us, for the program schedule for registration and for the amount of Category 1 CEUs that have been awarded for each of those programs. Um, as you know, our programs are free for everyone. You only have to pay if you actually want or need that CEU certificate. We want you all to participate in this community learning experience. Also, please give us a few days for us to get the survey out to you for the uh, evaluation. And then when we get that return from you, we will send your uh, certificate out to you to the email address with which you used to register for the program. Okay, this is the most important thing. If you have not already done this, somewhere right here is a red subscribe button. You need to click that button right now if you have not already done it. You can even start as many different YouTube, Gmail, email accounts you want and subscribe early and often. That'd be fine with me. Also, there's a bell right here. That bell is for you to receive notifications if we add a program, which could very well happen. We want to grow this community. And so right now we have scheduled all the way through December 31st of this year, uh, programs that have already been planned, but we can always add programs and clicking that bell will help for you to get those notifications. It'd be very important. We're also always looking for great content, looking to improve the end user experience and f for trying to meet really your needs. We want this to be a pleasant experience and we want this to be something that is not only, of course, education is very important. We want it to be highly educational, but we also want it to have some level of enjoyment because if you're sitting there on your time watching, we want you to be able to enjoy yourself while you're doing that. So we want it to be interactive. We want you to feel like you're a part of this process. Here's a copy of our flyer. We also, of course, have the YouTube chat feature that you can use and I think Roger will put up our flyer and also where the YouTube chat is. You can't be in full screen mode to use it and you have to have a Gmail account. I think all of you know that already. And then we also have a phone number and you'll see a signal from me that says we're opening the phone lines and that phone is right here and you're welcome please to call in and ask Dr. Jones or whoever the faculty is for that particular day any question, me, you can ask me as well, any questions that you want. So if you don't already have a Gmail account during the commercial break, go get one so you can subscribe and so you can use the YouTube chat feature. Although I like it when you call in and have that actual voice communication. Also, please keep in mind, if somebody's already on the phone, you know, there's a 30 to 60 second delay. So if somebody is already online with us, and they're talking, then the phone might go to call waiting and may actually go to the, the voicemail. Don't be concerned, I'll call you back. I have no problem with that whatsoever, or just try to call us back. With that said, this, um, this, this evening's program, I think, is really outside of the box, okay? We've, we've talked about cardioplegia, we've talked about the use of systemic hyperkalemia, for myocardial protection from minimally invasive mitral valves. We've talked about transcranial Doppler. We've talked about stroke. Uh, we've talked about ECMO. We've talked about uh, differences in generational differences in work ethics. I mean, we have really, this is our ninth program. We've covered a lot of stuff. But tonight's program, and then of course last night with Dr. Badia, um, that was really a great conversation talking about validating graft patencies. We've had some really, really good presenters and presentations. The, the one with the x-rays from Dr. Duvall, x-ray, MRI, and, uh, and or CT and TEE 
uh, 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 interpretation for the perfusionist. But tonight's program really, really goes outside of the, 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 what's the normal categories for perfusion, talking about nutrition and talking about nutrition and its effect on disease and also the cardiovascular benefits of cannabinoids. And we have with us this evening, Dr. Gary Jones, I think we're gonna pull him up here in just a second. And I've known Dr. Jones for, I mean, it's been 15, 20 years. We have a, uh, a long standing, in fact, the first time I did that systemic hyperkalemia was on one of his patients. We even did one of his patients three times with the technique, who was a renal failure patient. But we have had, uh, we have worked together on a number of different projects, and he is by far one of the most well spoken and well versed on the topic of nutrition and disease. And now he has really gotten into cannabinoids. And with that said, let me introduce you. This is Dr. Gary Jones of Louisiana Cardiovascular and Thoracic Institute in Alexandria, Louisiana. He uh, trained in the United States Army at Walter Reed, and he has been in Alexandria now for about 25 or 30 years. I think he can correct me on that if he needs to. And uh, Dr. Jones, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joe. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's fantastic to see you. Great. So, um, the, so I've already described, I think, did you hear my opening remarks where I talked a little bit about we're really going outside of the box with this evening's program, talking about nutrition and disease and cannabinoids and the cardiovascular benefits. Um, before you get your program started, do you have anything you'd like to share with the audience um, in preparing them for your presentations? Well, I think, Joe, when you talk about nutrition in, in any type of disease uh, in medicine, uh, what we're really talking about is trying to put ourselves out of business, which is what we should be doing, really. I mean, we sometimes have the revolving door of patients coming back, coming back, coming back. But we're not sharing with them, actually, the keys to how to prevent disease. And hopefully tonight we're going to share some of that with you and your audience, uh, that they might take it back and... Uh, and not use it for them, share it with some friends or family that uh, they might benefit from this. Very good. Well, without uh, any further ado then, why don't we go ahead and put your, your, uh, pr your uh, presentation up. And I think what we'll do is, can we divide it up into two sections? We'll do the nutrition and disease first and go to some Q&A session after that and then take a quick break, let everybody get a, another drink or go, use the restroom, and then we'll go right into the cannabinoids, if that'll be, work well with you. That's fine. Perfect, okay. So with that said, Vic, uh, can you go ahead and get the uh, share your screen? There you go. Perfect. I think you need to go to the first slide, though. There you go. Excellent. So, Joe, you know what, after our conversation of what you wanted and what I had to offer, this is going to be like a, a practical nutrition approach to coronary heart disease, okay? But it's going to spread out some other issues too, some other diseases too, later on, as you'll see, uh, because I think when you try to implement this uh, with a patient, um, number one, it's probably very difficult for them to sometimes comprehend, although it seems very simple. Number two, it can be very expensive for them and therefore make it prohibitive. Uh, so you have to be more practical on how you're going to get the message across to them that it's something they can actually do. Because most people, I, it sounds good, doc, but I can't do it for various and sundry reasons. So as you're gonna find out, um, there are places in the world, because we're really talking about health and wellness, okay? Whether it be cardiac health and wellness, uh, just overall health and wellness, because if you, if you over, if you have overall health and wellness, your heart's working well too. Uh, and there are certain places in the world right now that have been found where uh, centurions are really uh, a large part of the population. Uh, now, it's not everywhere for sure. I mean, the average lifespan in the United States right now is 78.2 years. But there are places where you can see centurions not infrequently. Uh, and I'm gonna share those places with you. Uh, and I got this from a guy who came to 
uh, Louisiana College here in Alexandria in Pineville, oh, I guess about four or five years ago. His name is Dan Butner. And Dan, Dan shared with us, some of the audience may be familiar with this, Blue Zones areas, where people uh, did certain things. He came up with nine ways to live uh, that promoted health and wellness. So when you're doing these nine things, your heart is benefited from it. Your immune system is benefited from it. Your lungs are benefited from it. Your brain is benefited from these things. Uh, but at the same time, inadvertently, it is incorporating some of these nutritional supplements in, uh, that we're going to be talking about without them maybe even knowing it. Uh, and therefore, they benefit from the uh, nutrition as a lifestyle rather than as a diet uh, for long periods of time. So with, with that said, we have to look at what, what's the problem. Let's move back here. Can you hit the keys on the arrow? The uh... There you go. We got it. So as we all know, coronary disease or heart disease is very prevalent in the United States. Uh, we have about 610,000 people die of from heart disease. That's overall. But as you can see from coronary heart disease, which is the most common type of heart disease, about 370 people die annually from that, okay? But every year, so between 735,000 Americans have a heart attack. Wow. And 525 was the first heart attack. The other 210,000 is the second heart attack. So, uh, you know, it's a very prevalent problem. And it's one I can actually tell you that I think with some uh, 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 guidance to the patient, uh, that this can be decreased significantly. But when you still have a country that's allowing cigarettes to be utilized, and I'm going to start talking about things that are legal but lethal. See, it's legal, but it's lethal. We're going to have something that's not legal and not lethal. Uh, but right now, cigarettes are one of those things that is legal but lethal. And that's how our country let this thing go forward. There's no actual uh, medical uh, benefit from being um, addicted to cigarettes. Patients talk about, well, I have to have my cigarette because it, it calms me down. No, you're getting down off your habit because you are addicted. So again, this is lethal, I mean legal, but lethal. So there's some things we can certainly do to decrease this almost immediately, but for political reasons, not medical reasons, but for political reasons, we don't, like, we don't have our choice. We have a freedom of choice. And you see how they are sort of hypocritical later on in our conversation, but freedom of choice to I want my cigarettes, I want my cigarettes. So um, again, there are certain things that we can do that will allow us to decrease this almost instantaneously over, I'm sure, over the next five to 10 years if we wanted to, but politically, that's not happening. Those areas I was talking about earlier that Dan Butner found, it's all over the world, different places, and uh, they have different some of lifestyles, but they do share some things in common. I'm gonna talk about that later too. So there's one place in Sardinia, Italy, Greece, western coast of Costa Rica, Seventh day Adventists, mainly in Loma Linda, California area, a good friend uh, over there, Dr. Bailey and his colleagues, and Okinawa, Japan. They have large populations of centurions here because they have adapted a lifestyle. I think any time people start talking about diet, see, diet means I'm going to go on the diet, I'm coming off the diet. Well, that's not going to be beneficial for the long run. You have to have a lifestyle change. This is what I do. This is how I do things. I'm not doing it for a month. I'm doing it for a lifetime. So you have lifestyle changes. So how and why are these people uh, doing so well? Um, is be and we're going to talk about it a little bit later too. But they have low incidence of diabetes. These are the risk factors for coronary heart disease. We all know these. Diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, family history. Although the Danish study only shows that 20%, only 20% of coronary heart disease is genetically caused. I have patients all the time say, well, it runs in my family. Heart disease runs in my family. But when you sit down and really question them, why is it running in your family? You find out that because they're still doing the same thing that grandmother did 50 years ago. I'm still eating high fat foods. I am eating carbohydrates like in drinking water. I don't exercise. You know, I, uh, I do the same thing. So it's not really genetic. It is definitely environmental. Uh, but they get played off as a genetics. Then obviously the diet. That is extremely important. You can't get around it. Uh, but again, it's not the only thing. You have to incorporate into a lifestyle that incorporates good diet, nutrition with exercise. So uh, 
these are some of the things we'll be talking about tonight. So diabetes, well-known cause of coronary heart disease, worldwide prevalence. 66% of American adults are overweight. 66% of Americans are overweight. I'm going to say that again. 66% of Americans are overweight. So if we got attacked today, we couldn't even run from our enemy. Okay? They're going to catch us. We can't run. We don't run. So, I mean, you know, that is a big problem. And with that comes the onset of uh, type 2 diabetes. Here's a more, even more disturbing fact is that 33% of American children are overweight. Okay? We start to see diseases in our young people, especially coronary disease, that we didn't see into people in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Now we've seen it 40s and 50s and 60s. You know, that disease has now grasped a younger age group and is going to make them uh, have to deal with it, whether it be from a medicine standpoint or surgical standpoint. But it's certainly going to be a disability for them to carry. Um, so, I mean, this is a very huge problem. Hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, which diabetes then causes micro and macrovascular disease. I mean, people go blind with diabetes, as we well know, from the uh, microvascular problems. And then coronary disease, you know, per peripheral arterial disease. Um, and then, like I said earlier, the obesity factor. So these are all things that are nutritionally uh, dependent. We talk, I talked about serious smoking already. You know, that's a well-known cause of uh, coronary heart disease, causes intimal damage, but it causes cancer. I mean, Dr. Oshner, Alton Oshner, back in 19, early 20s, he told a story about how his professor asked him to come down to the pathology lab because he had a case he wanted to show him. And this is off the subject of heart disease, but sure how people would keep these addictions. And what he showed was one of the first cases of lung cancer. And it was actually from one of the dough boys who came back from World War I because they were given cigarettes. Then they got addicted. Now here comes the first case of lung cancer. You may not ever see one again. Well, not only do you see one, he saw hundreds, thousands, all the way down the road, okay? We were still seeing it today. But now it's in women too. It also causes heart disease. It causes intimal damage, oxidation, okay? And then we come back with the repair of this with the cholesterol. So uh, it's a known risk factor. It's still that, you know, so my point about Dr. Oxford was he, he said in 1935 in the pharmacology book, that cigarette smoking is harmful to your health. We had guys testifying in Congress that cigarette smoking is the safest eating a Twinkie. Well, Twinkie's not that great either, you know, but they did it anyway. Uh, so cigarette smoking, heart disease, lung cancer, very well known, we're still doing it. High blood pressure, again, well known a risk factor for coronary heart disease um, and control uh, high blood pressure. We've seen decrease in just heart disease and stroke, but patient compliance is important. You know, there's a social uh, implication with uh, uh, these things. So they want to not follow the diet. The DASH diet is out to help with high blood pressure, but our patients continue to be non-compliant. Um, family history, I talked about it earlier, how only 20% is genetically caused. It's environmental more than it is genetic. We talk about diet, you know, there are different types of diet. I can go through very, a number of them. I think the audience probably is very familiar with several low carbohydrate, low fatty diets. But when you think about it, and I always tell a story of this patient I had. Uh, in fact, I saw his brother today. Uh, the gentleman came, he's about six foot three, weighed 300 pounds, and uh, I did a three vessel bypass on him. Did great. Uh, I didn't see him again for about two months. He came back, he had lost almost 75 pounds. Now, you know, I do weight loss constantly and things, but I've never seen anybody lose that much weight that fast. So I asked his wife, I said, what did you do? So I made him eat one time. So he made him eat one time, what do you mean? She said, well, he was eating three times at night time, so I made, had him eat just one time. So a lot of our problem is not what we're eating, it's how much we're eating. I mean, we eat a lot of food in America. The average woman just needs 2,000 calories per day to maintain good health. And men need about 2,500. I guarantee you, if you sit down and take an inventory of a daily food intake, a lot of us are way over that number. Probably in the fourth. <laughs> you volunteering, Joe? Yeah, I know I'm over. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we all have a problem. We go to New Orleans, you've got to get over, over that, that number. But I think on a daily basis, the average is 3,000, 4,000 calories a day. But you can't burn that many calories a day. So it builds up as excess fat or whatever. And it brings on diabetes you know, brings on heart disease. So it's a cascade of things that takes you down that, that road that you can do away with. 
And if you don't think this is a problem, uh, here's a, a slide I got from the CDC that shows the incidence of obesity as it changed from 1986 up into uh, I think the early uh, 2000s. As you notice, the states are going to get darker. As they get darker, they turn into maroon. The incidence of obesity is increasing. You know, uh, there's a lot of things you can say that started this problem. You know, creating all these couch potatoes, uh, the internet, people on phones. You see children on phones. They 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 say they video it, but they're not playing. You know, they're playing these games on the video, but not really playing to sweat. So they they develop this this sickness. I call it. Uh, uh, not uh, benefit from true healthful things. So as you can see now, it's 2003 and the states are really getting dark. You can notice the southern states always turn it first. You know, they go lose that Mississippi over 30%. Uh, and this is a patient being obese. So, I mean, it's, it's a national problem. But what I want to show you here pretty soon, you're going to see it as, this, as these numbers increase, it also, that's 2010, so it's eight years ago. It also goes in direct correlation, notice where the dark redness on the calendar is, on the states are, to the incidence of heart disease. <clears throat> Still in the southern belt, you can see where we are right in the middle of Louisiana, we're right in the middle of the boot right there. High incidence of obesity, high incidence of uh, coronary heart disease. So there's a good correlation there. Also, so again, so it's with diet, lack of exercise. Notice the western states, not so much. So what is the real problem? The real problem is very simple. There's two complex uh, entities that we can attack as well as treat. And I'll get to that later too when I'm thinking about that, but it's inflammation and oxidation. These are the two entities that causes the damage internally, especially on our arteries, that then become repaired okay, by uh, Foam cells, cholesterol causes the plaque and causes the blockage. Therefore, it causes ischemia in certain different areas, whether it be the brain for stroke, heart for heart attack, the legs for not getting enough gangrene and uh, uh, claudication. So inflammation, oxidation. And I think everybody understands what these are, but just to go real quick, okay? Uh, you think about oxidation, <clears throat> you think about... Um, Throwing a pair of pliers out in the front yard, just leave my death for two weeks. When you come back, you know they're going to be rusting. That rust is oxidation. Okay, so uh, this is what happens inside our bodies when we do things like cigarette smoking, high fatty diets, high carbohydrate diets, no exercise. Um, we start to rust on the inside, so to speak. That rust in our system is called plaque. Okay, so as we do this, it accumulates. Now we're having disease in these blood vessels. Again, whether it's the eyes, the carotid arteries for stroke, the heart, or the lower extremities for peripheral arterial disease. So that's oxidation. And I, like I said earlier, we start to see it in younger and younger patients uh, who we didn't see this before. I mean, I've been this practice. I just celebrated my 40th year graduate from medical school. Wow. So over those 40 years, I've seen this progression backwards of disease. So instead of us getting rid of disease, it's being developed uh, in younger and younger patients. Um, I'm sort of a, 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 a theorist that I think there's a reason behind this whole thing. I, I always tell my people, sometimes I'm going to write a book about the, the, uh, the uh, food industry and medicine working together to cause these problems, keep them in that circle, you know, keep them going. Uh, but oxidation, what happens right there? Inflammation, again, is a damage. It's happening to inside the body when it's exposed to some type of foreign materials. Now, in this situation, it could be viruses. It could be, again, high just proteins from foods that we're eating. But as inflammation takes place, it causes damage on the inside of our bodies. It then causes injury, blood vessels, again, being repaired, or attempt to be repaired by uh, cholesterol and causing blockages and uh, uh, then stroke, heart attack, uh, peripheral vascular disease. So when you talk about nutritional supplements, Joe, for a long time, so we knew these problems were going on. We talked about, is there a way for us to deal with this from a supplement standpoint to eradicate these problems very easily without um, uh, having to go to very extreme circumstances where there be medicines that have side effects, a surgery that can have complications. Now, with that said, now obviously there have been a lot of great things developed medically and surgically that benefit 
a lot, a lot of people. Okay. With that said, though, I still believe that we can still do better uh, if we put our emphasis in the right places. Uh, but it has to happen both uh, from a medical as well as the political uh, arena. Uh, so there's been much controversy about the need for supplements. There's no doubt in certain instances this is necessary. And there's a long history of supplements, deficiency diseases. Now, this history of deficiency diseases lets us know that as we don't have access or we don't have these nutri nutritional supplements in our bodies, bad things are going to happen. Okay? Bad things are going to happen. And I'll start off with vitamin C. I think everybody knows the story of vitamin C with the British sailors and how they'd be on these long journeys. And before the journey was completed, they started having a lot of problems. Uh, as you can see, here's some of the stages of the scurvy on the screen. Lethargy and fatigue, bleeding gums, anemia, high fever, and delirium. Uh, but when they would land on these uh, paradise islands and they got to eat some fruit and uh, vegetables, they got cured. They didn't know why, though. But it automatically those symptoms went away. Later went on to find out that it was because of the vitamin C. And the British Navy then made it necessary to put lines on the ships such that the sailors had access to vitamin C. So that's how they got the name Alimis. The British service known as Alimi. Um, now, I'm going to tell you now, that was, that was obviously a deficiency. But there are still undetected cases of vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin C is a very powerful antioxidant. And I can guarantee you that we don't get enough in our daily diet. People don't eat fruits and vegetables like they should. Uh, I have patients who say, I've never eaten a fruit or vegetable. And you have heart disease at 40 years old. Now I know, you know why. Uh, so there are undetected cases of vitamin C deficiency that could benefit from people eating fruits and vegetables to be the best thing. Whole food supplements would be the best thing. But if not, supplementing with uh, vitamin C. Okay? A daily dose of vitamin C has a similar effect of walking on a protein called endothelium 1 which promotes constriction of small blood vessels. So if the endothelium one makes your blood vessels constrict, okay? So if you walk, if you take vitamin C, walking makes endothelium one less prevalent. So you don't have basal constriction, okay? The blood vessels open up, they dilate. Vitamin C has the same effect. So it's a very beneficial vitamin. Uh, again, eat whole food in all my things I'm telling you, whole food is always better. Because there's an entourage effect in the um, foods that we don't realize that was put there. I mean, an apple has 10,000 phytochemicals. You, know, you can't just pull out one thing out of the apple and say, this is great. No, all those 10,000 phytochemicals were put there for a reason. Okay, And when you eat the whole apple, it does keep the doctor away. So, I mean, you know, those are the kind of things that we don't realize. So whole food something is always better. So, again, vitamin C. Uh, if you look at a chart of as vitamin C uh, went from the hunter-gatherer stage, agriculture, now the industrial age, you look at the, the years down at the bottom, our vitamin C levels have gone down, so is our vitamin E levels, total fat has gone up, saturated fats has gone up, trans fats has gone up. But what I didn't have, to, I couldn't find a slide to put on there, that all these, as the vitamins went down and all these other fats and things went up, so did heart disease. You know, a direct correlation. So as our diets changed, okay, so did our disease patterns, okay, and it's directly related to diet. Here's another one that everybody saw for me, vitamin D. Talking about deficiencies, deficiency syndromes, okay. Everybody realized vitamin D was caused by rickets. We have the bow legs, okay. Well, people don't realize that vitamin D was something of, the, you know, the sunshine vitamin, uh, get out of the sunshine, your vitamin D level goes up. Um, but vitamin D has also been shown to be a hormone. And it's definitely shown to help prevent coronary heart disease. Okay? It helps promote your immune system as well, too. So again, a deficiency in this one vitamin can cause these problems. Right now, we have 77% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. So anybody out there that goes to their family, family practice doctor needs to ask the doctor to check your vitamin D level. 77% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. It's very easy to supplement, get your vitamin D levels back up. Also associated with um, um, a psychosis. Uh, people say that's why I have a high rate of suicide up in the north because they don't have much sunshine. 
So uh, vitamin D. So we have vitamin D deficiency, but also hurts our hearts. Now vitamin D sort of got a bad rap. You know, it's a very powerful antioxidant. Uh, there are some studies done, one by Dr. Eva Long up in Manchester and Hamilton, Ontario, that said that supplementing with vitamin E uh, didn't benefit the patient, actually may have caused some harm. The one thing I have about with that study was the first thing, they use a low level of vitamin O, only 400 international units a day. You got to have to take more vitamin E than that, like around 1,000 international units a day. Plus, again, like I'm going to say, coming from whole fruits and vegetables, the vitamin E in those uh, 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 plants would help you boil because of the entourage effect of everything working together. Vitamin E doesn't work very well together it's with selenium. So you have to have vitamin E with selenium to get some benefit from it. One of my big ones is a story I would tell about coenzyme Q10. When I came here 30 years ago, I was talking about coenzyme Q10. Nobody knew what I was talking about. I thought it was like a, a witch hunt or something. Uh, but now you can't turn on TV. Somebody's trying to sell coenzyme Q10. Uh, again, it's an antioxidant. Your body produces it naturally. Uh, but over time, you start to produce less. Okay? But your mitochondria needs coenzyme Q10 to generate ATP. We know this to be the energy. Your whole body needs, but certainly your heart cells functioning to be healthy. Okay, like I said, levels of coenzyme Q10 decrease as your body decreases with age. Okay, as you take coenzyme Q10, especially when people can just heart failure, you benefit from that. It's also been shown that people taking statins now uh, benefit from being on coenzyme Q10 because it associated the low levels as you take a statin, your coenzyme Q10 levels, levels even going further, even fifty percent. So you get the myopathies. So you got to take coenzyme Q10. Very powerful antioxidant. But here's one. I like to tell this story too. Glutathione. Very powerful antioxidant, if not our most powerful antioxidants. Essential to cell survival. A deficient cardiac and systemic glutathione, glutathione release to consist of heart failure. There's a story about this guy. He was from Greece. He was in America in the 60s maybe the late 50s, and uh, he had a uh, debilitating disease. His doctor told him he was going to die uh, soon. So with that knowledge, he said, well, I want to go back home and be with my family. So he went back to Greece. A year passed, he hadn't died yet. Five years, he hadn't died yet. Ten years, he died. Thirty years later, he still hadn't died. He came back to America to tell his doctor he was still living. Well, his doctor had died. Okay? <laughs> so he went and looked at it. He was eating a stuff called purslane which is a Greek plant that's high in glutathione, uh, produce, helps produce glutathione. They eat it in everything. Salads, any meats they do, it's everywhere. It's like our lettuce. Uh, but uh, he benefited from having the glutathione levels increase it. Again, helps with his energy production, ATP. Uh, and he was lived a long, healthy life after that. Again, that's in Greece, the area I was talking about earlier for one of those blue zone areas. Curcumin. Uh, this is the polyphenol responsible for the yellow color and the curry spice uh, turmeric. Good anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-carcinogenic, anti-thrombotic, and cardiovascular protective effects. Okay? One of those things you need to have in your diet. It can attenuate adriamycin induced cardiotoxicity. Okay? And it can prevent cardiovascular complications. Again, one of those nutrients and supplements that you need to have in your diet. Here's another one that's come out recently say that if you don't have enough NAD, uh, you're going to have a problem. It impacts your cardiovascular system directly and indirectly. It also modulates whole body metabolism. Now, this is the thing I really want to emphasize. As your whole body is doing better, so is your heart, so is your brain, so is your lungs, so is your liver. Whole body metabolism. And that's extremely important. How does it do that? It does the endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide, we're going to talk about it later, too. It's one of those, again, nutrients that you have to have. Here it is right here, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, actually, uh, one, I can't remember the doctor's name right now, won a Nobel Prize for nitric oxide not too long ago. Uh, it found nitric oxide has a lot of positive things. Uh, and uh, I, I, sometimes I really believe if we were to uh, potentiate us developing people with more nitric oxide in their bodies, we would get rid of a lot of problems. Nitric oxide expands the blood vessels, increases blood flow, decreases plaque growth. Extremely important. Decreases plaque growth. Again. Not too many things can say that. Okay? And blood clotting. It helps with erectile dysfunction. If anybody doesn't realize, nitric oxide is what Viagra works with. Okay? And Cialis. Okay? So I tell my people all the time that everybody should be taking Viagra and Cialis pretty soon. Heart disease. 
they already use it for pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension, you know, for vasodilatation. So it's being used already in the cardiovascular area, but not for coronary disease to get rid of plaque, open up blood vessels and the like. It's a gas in our system, so you can't really take it as a gas. You have to take the precursors to the nitric oxide. Where can you get uh, a lot of uh, precursors to that? It would be in dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, dark chocolate. Citrus, pomegranates, walnuts, arugula, spinach, watermelon, and beets in particular. Matter of fact, there's a company that sells a beet powder you can take. I can tell you I drink it every morning. Uh, but again, to increase your nitric oxide levels uh, in your body. That's a very important. But again, the, the, it, you can do all this preaching if you want to, Joe, but if the patient does not become compliant, uh, you preach to the, you know, you, you just, it's not going to do any good. Uh, like I said, life expectancy for America today is 78.2 years. But this year, over 70,000 Americans reached the age of 100. So what are they doing that most Americans uh, not doing or won't do, okay? And I emphasize more on won't do. Uh, they can complain about the government and whatever, but like I tell you all, when you go to the grocery store, I don't see anybody standing behind you from the government saying, uh, you need to buy all that bacon. Uh, you need to go get all those cookies. Uh, you need, there's nobody, it's a choice you have to make. You have a choice. So it exercise that choice uh, at, 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 as you go shopping, okay? So again, with compliance, I talked about lifestyle changes, not diet. So all those things we talked about uh, are very important, but if you don't implement as a lifestyle change, uh, it's not, you're not gonna benefit in the long run because you can't do it on Wednesday and Thursday. I'm gonna think about it two weeks from now, it has to be an everyday occurrence, which is what these people in these areas do in the blue zone areas that we talked about earlier. So they have incorporated a lifestyle that they do things that they normally do. It's not, it's, not a, it's not going out the way to do this for them. This is what they live, how they live, okay? So there were nine things that they did, or they do, I'm sorry, they do, that they benefit from. And one is they move naturally. They don't have exercise gym. They don't do that kind of thing. The sheep herder in, in Sardinia, he walks about five miles and he's herding sheep. That's his job, okay? But a lot of his friends had that same job. So therefore, uh, he benefited from that way. Now, obviously, these areas live in a, in a, in a uh, simpler lifestyle area, okay? But it shows that the exercise does work. Okay, he has a purpose. He wakes up in the morning, he's got a purpose. Whether it's me, I'm taking care of my family, I'm doing something for friends, whatever. It's not like I'm lost, I don't know what to do. He has a purpose, okay? They know how to downshift by taking it easy. Stress, you know, will put uh, some, some uh, bad things on you, whether it be increased adrenaline, make your heart rate faster, uh, cortisol levels, uh, increase your glucose levels in your body. So they know how to downshift. So we want people to downshift. You, you listen to the website on LACBT, we talk about yoga, meditation, and prayer. Whatever it was fits for you, that's what you need to do to downshift. And you need to do it every day, okay? What is the 80% rule? This comes from the, the uh, people in Okinawa. They developed this called Hari Hachibu, is what they call it, Hari Hachibu. What it means is when you go to dinner, you only eat 80% of the food. So we've been by clean that food off, eat everything. You know, till you feel well. They don't believe that. Uh, they eat eighty percent of the food. They don't eat the whole plate. Um, and we might want to say, let's get a smaller plate. That'd be good too. But when you have those, those twelve-inch plates and they filled out to the brim, um, think about eating only eighty percent of it. Okay. Now, another thing they do again that's nutritional, and they benefit from is they have a plant uh, slant on the type of food they eat. So, if I ask Americans right now, think of this. I'm gonna say one name. And the first thing that comes to your mind, I'm, I'm not going to answer tonight. I know, but what happens is when I say this one word, this is the, this is the natural thing everybody comes to. I'm saying right now, Thanksgiving. Turkey. If, if you didn't think about a turkey, you see, you didn't get the right answer. So you got the right answer, Joe. You did good. All right? Uh, <coughs> so we have a turkey, and we build a dinner around that. Well, in these areas, they don't have a turkey. They build up food around the plants that they have. They have meat around it. So they have a plant slant to their diet. Actually, they eat about four ounces of meat, maybe two or three times a week. That's about a deck of cards. Uh, four ounces about a deck of cards. So four ounces of meat, about um, uh, two or three times a week is what they can consume. They do, they're not teetotalers, except for the, the Seventh-day Adventists. Those are the only ones who are teetotalers. They do drink wine. 
So they benefit from the, the polyphenols, the resveratrol in the wine, okay? But they don't overdo it, okay? Teetotalers and people overdo alcohol are the ones who get hurt. Uh, they're in the middle, one to two drinks a day, mainly wine. The group in Sardinia has a special wine that's called Canano, okay? Canano. Matter of fact, I got, I got uh, one of the local wine dealers here in town to stop that so I can send my patients over they can get it at the, at the, at the, the place here in town. You go to your wine, people ask for it too. It's called Canano from Sardinia, Italy. Okay? They put loved ones first. Okay? Uh, they don't send the old folks off to the nursing home. They keep them there and take care of them. And usually they live in a long time. They still can work. They have things they can do for the family. They're very helpful. Okay? Um, they shift belong. In other words, they're still keeping that thing with family. The, uh, the Okinawans, they have a tribe, a, a group of people that from the time you were born, that's your group. That's your support group until the time you die. So you have these friends all the way through. I can tell you right now, I don't have uh, 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 four friends from childhood that call on telephone right now, and that's my fault. Uh, but they do that. That's another big thing. And it being the right tribe. Again, the whole thing about having a purpose, being with family and like. So all these things together. So if I tell you right now, take vitamin C, you're gonna live forever, that's not gonna happen. Take vitamin D, you're gonna live forever, it's not gonna happen. It's a more consuming lifestyle that you're gonna need to benefit from it. And you want healthy lifestyle. So if we talk about nutrition and heart disease, it's more than that. Your heart's have to be happy and it can be healthy. So, uh, but at the same time, you can't be happy and smoke cigarettes, eat donuts, don't exercise, whatever. That's gonna be unhappy heart, uh, whatever. So, and then so I'm gonna tell you, you have to inventory your lifestyle. Take those nine things, inventory your lifestyle, and see where you are on the uh, 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 map as far as keeping yourself healthy and uh, happy, and you have a happy heart. So I think you want to stop me, there, Joe, for a little break. So yes. Yeah, so well, let's get into some some discussion. Um, Jennifer Warner, a uh, perfusionist whom I've known for uh, uh, at least the past 12 years, said, uh, so, Dr. Jones, working in the operating room is basically going to kill me. No sun, no natural movement, high stress, and no wine at work. If you live in an operating room like that, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, again, you have to make the effort to Build in some time for yourself. It's extremely difficult. I can tell you, I'm fighting it all the time myself. Um, but it's necessary. Um, mm -hmm. Stress in the operating room, the donuts in the doctor's lounge, the soft drinks there, the no sunlight. Yeah, that's deleterious to our health. Mm -hmm. So you have to make time to uh, go out. There's one doctor I'm reading right now. He talks about getting your circadian clock always in sync. And to do that, you have to be outside in the daylight time to get some sun. Mm -hmm. if, you don't that, if you don't do that, your circadian clock is not going to be a time to write. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. You have to, it's an effort. You know, it's effort. Mm -hmm. and you have to make the effort to do it. Well, you know, and then that brings up, I think that, that, that that's a very good point. But we are in, and I, and I remember early on in your presentation, you did sound a little conspiratorish thinking uh, thought process, which, you know, Roger's sitting over there and I'm, I'm watching him shaking his head in an affirmation because he is a big time conspiracy theorist of every conspiracy you can imagine. Um, and, uh, but with that said, you know, our, ex the expectations of society, our employers, um, the, uh, the, the, who, who, whether they're direct employers or you are servicing a company, whatever it might be, the expectations are that you will be there before the sun comes up and you will stay here long after the sun has gone down because we have all of this work to do. And, you know, yes, it, it is a personal responsibility, but has our society not evolved or devolved, whichever you want to look at it, into a state of that is no longer respected or considered important. I think you're right about that. But you know, when you look at companies like, and I'm, I'm saying this, I've read about this, I haven't experienced it myself, I've seen it myself, uh, companies like Google and Yahoo and those places who put these play things in, in place for the people at work, these gyms at the place for people at work, 
the daycare for their children so they can bring their children so they can worry about the kids. Uh, there are some companies that are uh, on, the, on the forefront of, uh, of acknowledging that the worker got to be happy mm -hmm. and healthy. Mm -hmm. And you see, they get a very productive output uh, from those uh, workers uh, by the uh, fact that they're some of the leading biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing that hospitals, the, the, supposed to be the vanguard for health, hadn't really caught on to that too much. Mm -hmm. And, and okay, yeah, that, that's true. In fact, a lot of, you know, yes, Google is a humongous organization. You know, Amazon is a humongous organization. I, I get that. But, you know, in many cities, hospitals are the largest employer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so one would think that what you're saying would have already resonated and so you know I'll, I'll challenge you to ask when is it going to become mainstream accepted that the people who work in these high stress environments whether they're heart surgeons perfusionists crnas anesthesiologists uh scrub scrub techs um auto transfusionists whatever um have to are are are, are basically shortening their life because of their job. So when's that going to happen? And how does it happen? And what can we do as individuals in a society to help to uh, 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 stimulate that to happen? Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about one of the things I think that can help a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it becomes a political and a financial thing. I think unless it becomes expedient <clears throat> for the entity, whether it be a hospital, a business, to them, uh, then we're probably not going to see that too soon. Well, you have taught me a couple of things. I remember going around with you uh, uh, when I was working with you, and uh, on your higher risk patients, you would start them on coenzyme Q10 and a couple of other things with a cocktail before you took them to the operating room in uh, 24 to 48 hours. So, yeah. you know, can you can you elaborate a little bit on that, and are you still doing that? And do you have you anecdotally seen benefit? Oh, I'm definitely. I've been like you said, I've been doing that for over you know 30 years. Um, actually, I got the idea from Noel Mills, who was a Fantastic surgeon down in New Orleans. Yeah. Did your mom's surgery. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Six vessels. Yeah. By 1989, yeah. And lasted. Did 20 years. Yeah. 20. Yeah, she never had another thing, never had another cardiac uh, cath, never had another echo. She broke her hip and died at 87 from the complications of that. Her egg injection fracture was 65%. Mm -hmm. did, she, she was a did she change her lifestyle after the heart disease? Yeah, well, she was diabetic, you know, been for a long time. So she got that more in control, mm -hmm. and it, it helped a lot. Well, my brother-in-law is a doctor, and she lived in the hospital, so that helped out too. So, sure. Uh, but my cocktail that I use, Joe, my, well, I call it in this. I call it my myocardial enhancement uh, package. Okay, now I call it my voodoo medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a combination of things that when I see a myocardium in trouble uh, from a low ejection fraction and been stunned. I want to give it something to boost it up, you know, and these things I know can do it because if we develop more ATP in the myocardium, that's what helps when we try to come off bypass. So mm -hmm. uh, one, I do things like it's coenzyme Q10, it's vitamin E, it's vitamin C, it's L-carnitine, and I give some intralipids IV for fuel as well. 20% mm -hmm. intralipids. Hey, Roger, okay. can you open the, uh, the phone lines? I forgot yeah. to do that. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Jones. I just, we're going to put a message up. The phone lines are open. I forgot to do that, but go ahead. So can you give that cocktail one more time? And I'm so sorry. Yeah, no problem. So I say it's coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, vitamin C, acetyl L-carnitine, and I get some IV intralipids. Okay. And I trade it for 24 to 48 hours. Again, as a uh, measure of boosting the, the metabolism inside the heart for generating ATP. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to tell you to date, Joe, uh, it might be somewhat anecdotal, uh, but uh, every patient I've given it to has done well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's important. I mean, I think anecdotal evidence is, is compelling.
you know, especially, I mean, if, in my view anyway. So I had a, another couple of questions while we uh, wait until the signal goes through. There's a little delay, so it'll take about 30 or, or 60 seconds for people to see that the phone lines were opened. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, can you overcome these bad habits if you don't change the bad habits with these supplements? In other words, if you're, you know, if you're, you're maybe, maybe, maybe minimize some of them a little bit. Let's say you're, let's say you're at a hundred of just bad diet, bad habits, but you also, you go down to like 90% but you add these other things that you're talking about nutritionally. Yeah, it's not gonna work. Not gonna work? No. Not Hello, gonna you're on the yeah. air. Yes, this is Adam Mertens from Columbia, Missouri. Hey, Adam Merton. Uh, Adam Merton from Columbia, Dr. Jones. Okay, uh -huh. uh, how are you? Okay. Good, um, I'm, I'm curious as to the, what would you consider to be the number one uh, contributor to high cholesterol? High cholesterol? Yes. What would you consider to be the number one contributor to elevated cholesterol? Yeah. Well, you know, there are many things out there that have attributed to this, Adam. Uh, uh, and if you ever read a book called Sugar Busters many years ago by some doctors out of New Orleans, as a matter of fact, uh, I think they showed clearly that sugar and carbohydrates played a huge role in elevated cholesterol. I mean, we thought for a long time right. saturated fats. Now, saturated fats can do it too. But it appears right now that carbohydrates have a larger role in cholesterol elevation than saturated fats. Again, they're both bad players. I'm not trying to take light of saturated fats, but it's not as bad as we thought it was. Uh, and it appears that it's carbohydrates. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Hey. That's uh -huh. good. That was, that was really, in fact, I was, I was going to ask you about sugar busters. So, yes. you know. What do you think of that diet now, 30 years after that book was written? That was, uh, I think that was, uh, um, what was that? Mobethay. Mobethay yeah, from uh, Baptist Hospital in New Orleans was one of the authors of that book. Yeah. I think, I think you told me you worked with him for a while. I, well, one case. Okay. One case. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that again, Joe, that again, uh, sugar, legal but lethal. Mm -hmm. Le legal so do you think it's a good diet? I mean, do you think yeah, that I, it is a good versus a plant-based, plant slant diet that you described? Do you think Sugar Busters independently is a good diet program? I think anything where you don't overdo carbohydrates is good. Mm -hmm. and, and Sugar Busters, that's what that was all about, is decreasing your carbohydrate load, understanding the glycemic index, mm -hmm. and how to affect you, you know, whether you should eat white bread or, or not. Um, so, I mean, those, those things are very important for us to understand at that time. I mean, mm -hmm. that was an eye opener. Uh, so yes, I think that sugar busting is a good concept, but we still need some carbohydrates. We can't mm -hmm. do without carbohydrates. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a complex carbohydrate, whether it comes from beans or whatever, uh, but it's a high fructose sugars that get us in trouble. Whether mm -hmm. it comes from soft drinks or sugars or syrups or whatever, they get us in trouble all the time. Mm -hmm. So the buses was a, was an eye opener for us that we had to cut back on our carbohydrate intake to uh, not uh, feel the deleterious effect of having too much glucose and sugar and starches in our diet. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a question here um, from a person texting: Is it is the is the damage that occurs from um, acquired disease like CAD from diet and lifestyle from environmental uh, influences reversible? That's a very good question, and I'll, I'll give you a personal experience with that, okay? I had a lady, when I got here those many years ago, I did an emergency bypass operation on, and uh, she did well for heart surgery. Uh, preoperatively, she had a 70% carotid lesion that I thought I'd be f have to fix later. Got her through the surgery, she came back to see me, and then we followed up for a while. Six months later, when we followed up, we repeated the she got lost to follow for a while. But we repeated the, the ultrasound of a carotid, and that 70% lesion now was 20%. Wow. Now, I, I, was, shocked. I was shocked, you know, and I, because I knew the first study was valid. It was done in our office, and she was a, uh, we have a good ultrasonographer. And so I just sat with her, and I know she had lost a lot of weight. 
And so I said, well, what did you do? And she told me, she just, she started eating less. And that's a very important part too. And I said it earlier, sometimes not what we eat is how much we eat it. Okay, mm -hmm. we overeat it, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she ate less, she lost the weight. So when you look at the dynamics of an arterial plaque, okay, it's not all calcium, it's not all fibrous tissue, that's a component, that's a component called foam cells. Foam cells are really monocytes, okay? And they're dynamic. In other words, as you would have gone a, a, a serious diet, you can make that plaque smaller. Mm -hmm. Now, if the plaque is just full of calcium and fiber tissue, you're not gonna make that small. Mm -hmm. It's the consistency of the foam cells in the plaque that you do have opportunity to decrease that plaque if you're going to a serious diet. Mm -hmm. So that's as good, yes, can be reversible if it has the right uh, morphology, morphology of the plaque. Okay, fair enough. So before we go to, to break, let me just ask you to elaborate on one thing, but I'll also add these additional qu questions. One question is, where is my red perfweb.us cup? I will have that after the break. So, and then the other is, um, what's in the red solo cup? And it's iced tea. So uh, just so you know, it's iced tea. Good to know. Apparently, Dr. Jones wanted to, uh, somebody wanted to know that. Um, but with that said, listen, Dr. Jones, this has been, uh, I'm really looking forward to the cannabinoids. I think what we'll do is take a few minutes break, let you uh, stretch your legs a little bit, and then we'll come back uh, after about five minutes and uh, hit the, uh, the uh, talk on the cardiovascular benefits of cannabinoids. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you very much, sir. We'll go to five minute break. Perfusion. Oh, okay. We have an open heart one month from today, 9 a.m. start. Oh, really? A single vessel off pump? No problem. Thank you. Hey, Mom, can you bring me a sandwich?
ET in Alexandria, Louisiana. Welcome back, Dr. Jones. And uh, your next uh, presentation is going to be on cannabinoids and their cardiovascular benefit. And maybe you're going to touch a little bit on the uh, on, on other maybe other positive attributes that it has. Yeah. Well, let me say something to you about the last question the viewer had too about you know doing a little bit of something and something else. Can you benefit from it? Okay. Sure. I make this comment. Most people may not realize one cigarette. The effects of one cigarette last one week in your body. One cigarette. Wow. So, you know, when I tell my patients, well, doc, I'm down to three cigarettes, so you got to get to zero. You got to get to zero. You got to get rid of them all because that one cigarette is going to last one week in your body. So, you have to take on the responsibility of sort of getting rid of some things, then your diet and health, health that's not beneficial to you. Okay? So does that include cigars? That includes cigars too. Does it include? those other kind of cigarettes e-cigarettes no cannab no no the cannabis cigarettes <laughs> oh no. <laughs> since we're yeah, talking was, about since we're talking yeah. about cannabis today <laughs> yeah 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 actually uh you know there's no association between cannabis and lung cancer uh that i'm aware of uh and actually certain things like asthma it people benefit from it tremendously tremendously but I, i'll get into that pretty soon. Okay. So, so, okay. The floor is yours. Great. So what I thought I'd do right now is a little stimulating talk on what I call a new kid on the block. Okay. And it's stuff called CBD, which is cannabidiol. And I'm sure this is in the news all over. It's big news um, internationally. Uh, and I got to tell you, uh, uh, this is one of those things, like I'm going to tell you about sugar, legal, lethal. Tobacco, legal, lethal. This is one of those things that's illegal, but helpful. Okay? Uh, and we got to come to grips with this pretty soon uh, because this is one of those things that um, can benefit people tremendously from my readings and from what I've been hearing that we have to take advantage of. Dr. Well, you know Jones, history, Dr. Jones, I have to tell you that the team back here running the cameras and all of the web streaming and everything are high-fiving themselves back there. I, I don't have a camera to show you what they're doing, but they're all yeah. pretty excited with your comments. Well, we have to get down to what I'm really talking about, Jim. I'm not talking about smoking real marijuana. I'm talking about CBD, okay? And you're going to find that CBD really is like a marijuana cousin, uh, but the benefits of this thing is phenomenal. Um, now, here's come my conspiracy thing, because this really happened with this particular plant. And let's see, I think may have something here pretty soon, Joe. We got to get the little advancing thing back. There we go. Okay. So I see it's a new kid on the block, but it's been around for a long time. I mean, you can find cannabis way back in recorded history from the Chinese, the Egyptians. Uh, you find, go to history, you're going to find something about a cannabis based preparation. Okay. Um, and you even in America back in the 1930s, it was probably part of every doctor had it in his black bag when he went to Hopkins House School. Something called uh, cannabis. Uh, there was a doctor for Queen Victoria who would make a concoction for her with this stuff in milk, helps help with indigestion and things. So it's, it's been around for a very very long time. The the problem was that it was a very uh, 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 health plant okay here's my description of what i'm talking about hemp and cannabis or hemp and marijuana they're cousins like the citrus plant the lime and the lemon they're both citrus plants but it's not the same they don't taste the same and hemp and marijuana is the same thing marijuana has a very high content of thc which we're all familiar with what it does okay very little cbd hemp on the other hand has a very high concentration of cbd but very little THC, and therein lies the difference. Uh, people think that they can look at a plant and tell you if it's hemp or marijuana. The hemp is tall, marijuana is short and bushy, or whatever. I can tell you that you cannot tell the difference unless you do a chemical analysis, see the content of the THC and the CBD. If there's a high content of THC, I don't care how short and bushy or tall that thing is, that's marijuana. If there's a high concentration of CBD, that's hemp. So you have to look at it from a 
chemical standpoint to really tell you um, which one it is. So what happened was that in the 1930s, it was very well accepted, uh, but it was a very, like I said, ferocious plant. It grows very well. And it's used for a lot of different things. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, one of the drafts was written on hemp paper. Uh, even the first flag Betsy Ross was designed was a hemp cloth flag. Uh, sales of boats were made from hemp plants. Uh, it's ferocious. And as it got better, people looked into it for petroleum reasons. But paper was the real thing that it was being used for. Uh, unfortunately for hemp, uh, one of the giant titans at the time, William Randolph Hearst, who ran all of the newspapers at that time, a lot of them anyway. You still have magazines out there today with the Hearst Company. Uh, he was invested in paper too, but it wasn't in him, it was in trees. So this was a very big competitor to his tree business. So he had to outlaw this stuff. And it, you have to really read the history, but it's very interesting and, and sad at the same time. Mm -hmm. More and conspiracies. What they it was a conspiracy, yes, exactly right. They do exist. Tell Roger, they do exist, okay? Mm -hmm. He's and they agreeing. Tied him to, huh? He's agreeing with you. Oh, yeah, I know he's agreeing because it probably tied some of his... Anyway, marijuana is a name given by Mexicans to this cannabis plant, the one that got you high. And they knew they were, they knew they were cousins. So what they did was they put up this, this uh, uh, sort of be marketing conspiracy thing in the newspapers where he ran the newspaper. There was no internet. There was no TV, very little radio. When you read it, it must be true. So they said these things causing problems with Mexican and Negroes and raping people and things like that. And the American public bought it. They tied him into that, made it illegal. He got rid of a problem. We something we did benefit from the medical side of help that could help us and can still help us today if we get the politics straight. Um, so the cannabinoids, which are the part that we talk about, and to make this thing simple, uh, our bodies have this system called the endocannabinoid system. We have it since birth. It was put there for us. It's not something we got implanted in us. It's been there forever. Okay, we didn't know this until about the late '80s, 19, early 1990s. But then we found out that there is something called an endocannabinoid deficiency. We can, uh, like in like diabetes, or whatever, lose the benefit of the cannabinoids to excite this system to do what it does best. And we're going to talk about they have CB1 receptors, CB2 receptors. Ones we make inside of our body called, is called endocannabinoids. In other words, it's, it's endogenous to us. Okay? The phytocannabinoids are the ones that we consume, like the CBD from hemp. Okay? But you can find it in other plants too. Um, echinacea, flax, common tea, kava, and hops. But the main one that we're talking about right now is going to be the CBD that you get from hemp. These are the we call them the ligands, actually the neurotransmitters, because you have the receptors. But the thing that makes the receptors connect in the endocannabinoid system are these particular uh, products. The ones on the left, the anadiamide and the 2-AG are endocannabinoids. These are the ones our bodies make normally. They become depleted. But the cannabidiol, again, is a phytocannabinoid, one that we can eat endogenously and benefit from. <clears throat> Again, it stimulates the endocannabinoid system and the life. So you have these <clears throat> cannabinoid extracts from the hemp plant. So when you eat the whole hemp, hemp plant, I get, you know, eat it, but you get the benefits from it. And we're not talking about smoking hemp because you can smoke hemp all day. You're never going to get high. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Okay. <clears throat> but you have this, the, all the benefits from it, the, the uh, terpenes, the flavonoids, uh, the chlorophyll, as well as the CBD that you benefit from when you have the whole hemp plant in the product, and that's called the entourage effect, where you get everything out there. So again, this endocannabinoid system is a regulatory system in our bodies that's put there for us to stay self-regulated, but it has to be fueled by the cannabinoids, either endogenous cannabinoids, the endocannabinoids, are the phytocannabinoids, 
the ones you can take up by mouth. Uh, so this is the way I, I kind of look at this system. It's like in the front of the line. <coughs> Excuse me. So we should always be driving straight ahead. But unfortunately, some things that you know, wheel flat or whatever, you go to one side or the other. And what can do that for us as people? Well, high blood pressure and stress can take us off to one side. Diabetes and pain can take us to the other side. This endocannabinoid system keeps us going in a right direction, okay? Uh, people who have had blood pressure been on three medicines, I know they've taken this stuff and come off blood pressure medicines altogether. Uh, guys I've known have post-traumatic stress can take this product and get, get, get some relief. Diabetics have come off of insulin taking this product. One of the biggest things out there right now is companies looking at a way to capitalize on CBD in its pain relief form to fight the opioid crisis. And yet, our country continues to make this an illegal product uh, in view of the millions of people who are dying from the opioid crisis. Again, you have in the, in the cannabinoid system, CB1 neurotransmitters mainly in the brain is where they associate that, okay? Uh, and the CB2 receptor, here's CB1 again, I'm sorry, brain, you can see these are receptors in the brains, in the brain tissue that helps to uh, keep us in a regulatory system. The CB2 receptors made in the gut system and it's the immune stimulator. So it helps us from a uh, neurologic standpoint as well as an immune standpoint, but so many other things as well. So we talked about deficiency earlier, vitamin C deficiency vitamin D deficiency, okay? There's also an endocannabinoid deficiency. And this is one, again, it goes unnoticed, un, and then subsequently untreated. When this finally becomes recognized as a mainstream deficiency syndrome, they're gonna have to allow us to treat the syndrome with the appropriate uh, uh, products. And I don't wanna say medicine because it's not really a medicine. Here's the problem. One of my conspiracy theories again, Joe, is that because it's not able to get a patent on this, okay, it's mainly listed now as a food. You can't get a patent on an apple or orange, okay? This is a plant too. Uh, there lies the hang up. If you've been watching news here recently, uh, one of the products just got put on the market for treatment of seizures. Uh, you may have heard the, the, the story about the little girl who had the 300 seizures a month, mm -hmm. family had given up for dead, had made a DNR, they moved to Colorado because they heard some news about these RLs that may benefit from the little girl. So she moved over there, started taking these RLs, and she woke up. Hardly had any seizures, maybe one a month now, okay? It was CBD that did that, okay? There are a plethora of these cases now out there. So there's one company, just went on the market last week, um, I can't think of the name of the company, the, 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 uh, the, I think it's Ep 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 Epidiolex or something like that, that they're out there marketing now, but they've tied CBD to something else to make it a medicine, okay? You don't need the medicine. You just need the regular straightforward CBD. <clears throat> but again, it's not big dollars made for if you're selling plants and apples and oranges, uh, but they still work. Uh, so again, we do have some deficiencies in this, okay? And until we, let's say, identify this as a deficiency syndrome that needs to be treated, um, it's not going to go far too far. Now, again, we also know that endocannabinoid cyst deficiency is one is a good cause for Alzheimer's. This is a study done in Stanford. Okay, if you Google CBD anything, you're gonna get a litany of literature out there on this product. It's being studied by a lot of people. Uh, a little funny thing is that the state of Mississippi uh, doesn't allow uh, you to uh, uh, use CBD, but it is the CBD capital, marijuana capital in the United States. Anybody doing research on CBD has to get their product from the University of Mississippi. So um, uh, we, we, we're coming there. We're not there yet. Uh, it's going to be recognized as a very valuable product for our health. Again, the conspiracy theory. If you take somebody who's on four and five medicines, now you're only on one food product that takes care of high blood pressure, diabetes, stress, whatever. Uh, you just put a big dent 
in the finances of some big pharmaceutical companies. Those guys in the, got their pockets in the FDA. So it, it's going to be it's going to be a, a huge a fight. I talked about the entourage effect. You see, there's 500 chemical compounds native to the cannabis uh, uh, plant that acts synergistically, uh, and so taking the whole thing has been uh, great. If you want to really get a good uh, uh, understanding about this product, you need to go to one of the I guess TV sites, whether it is Netflix or whatever, and find Dr. Sanjay Gupta's uh, series on weed. I it watched it. His I watched it. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it changed his mind on it, this product. So, again, it, it, it's, it's coming. Uh, not to say our, our government is not hypocritical about this. We uh, now have this stuff federally, federally, uh, is still illegal. Um, and But we have a patent on it. The United States government has a patent on cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. So, you know, uh, uh, somebody was smart enough to realize that, you know what, uh, this is something that's going to become law. Is I don't know when, but you can go check that patent out, U.S. government patent 6,630,507, and you're going to find that patent that the United States government has on CBD, which is an illegal product called a class one drug in the United States, which uh, with the potential for this medication, this, this food, I'm sorry, um, is absurd uh, because now we're holding back treatment for people who could benefit from something that has hardly, if any, side effects as compared to other medicines that they have to take. What does CBD do? What is the research at? Like I said, epilepsy, metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome has a direct impact on coronary heart disease, heart failure, and whatever, okay? It's there with obesity, high blood pressure. Uh, so, you know, it, it's going to benefit that way. Broken bones, osteoporosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, anti-cancer, hmm. and neuroprotection, and such as traumatic brain syndrome. If you got anything to do like NFL, like we all like oh, Sunday watch the games, uh, those guys are hitting the head quite a bit. One of the things that the NFL players are trying to do now is get, get a permission <coughs> to use marijuana as a neuroprotectant for their brains. Uh, they're getting denied. Uh, so they're going to be subject to... Uh, 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 traumatic uh, brain injury that's not going to be treated, that could be treated, and they could not become vegetables. So the new kid on the block, like I said earlier, is not so new. Actually, been around since Jesus, it's something we call cannabosum aureus, or else that Jesus used to cure people with. Um, it's a hemp product, not a marijuana plant, like I said earlier. We still have some legal issues. Now, there are still eight states right now that's making it legal. I think Vermont came on made it number nine. It's legal. The big one everybody's waiting for is Canada. Uh, June the 7th, the whole country of Canada is going to go legal for both recreational and medicinal uh, marijuana, uh, putting us to shame as we should be leading on that. Uh, but they're going to go uh, 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 completely legal June the 7th, between then and July the 1st, they should be, the whole country uh, should be legal. Um, so we talked about the parts endocannabinoid system, CB1, CB2 receptors, the endocannabinoid uh, uh, ligands, or neuro, neuro, neuro uh, transmitters, phytocannabinoids, the CBD, and THC is, is, a, is, a, is a transmitter in this too, uh, but not as good as CBD. These are, again, how do we benefit from a cardiovascular standpoint? As I talked earlier, the main culprits of disease to include coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, uh, lung cancer, or you name it, uh, is inflammation and oxidation. This is a very powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory product, okay? It's more powerful than vitamin C and vitamin E. You can definitely benefit from this, okay? Uh, it's been reported that high levels of this in your body will decrease, well, sorry, increase HDLs and okay. lower LDLs, okay. your cholesterol. Okay? You're, you're on the line, but hold on one second. Dr. Jones is just wrapping up, I think. Go ahead, Dr. Jones. we got a caller already. Okay, good. So please go I ahead know and continue. From, I know from some people that I'm, I'm familiar with, they take it to lower their blood pressure. Uh, and I can tell you a quick, well, they lower their blood pressure. And... Uh, it promotes insulin production and sugar metabolism. 
So this product uh, is one that when we get to we realize oh. that we have this one product that can solve a lot of our ills to include coronary artery disease, uh, COPD, cancer, and the like, uh, we're going to do it. Again, my conspiracy theorist in me tells me it's going to take a while uh, because there's a lot of money at stake. I mean, this movie I saw, follow them, okay? And you can't get too much money in selling the plant. Um, so again, and I leave with this. I, I had this one of the articles I read. Mark Twain said, a lie can travel halfway around the world but tr before the truth gets his boots on. So I think with this particular product, uh, we still travel around our bare feet. We have a long way to go, but we need to get out and support these, uh, this product. It's beneficial to us. It's not addictive. And again, we're talking about hemp and CBD. We're not talking about marijuana and THC. We're talking about hemp and CBD. The medicinal benefits, that, that product has yet really to be tapped and us to take benefit from it from a whole lot of areas, whether the cardiovascular, the nervous system, the GI system, or whatever. Very good. I mean, that was, that was Doc, that was excellent. Um, Really enjoyed that. We actually have a caller now. Um, go ahead. You're on the air. Hi, Joe. It's Jennifer again. And good evening, Dr. Yeah. Jones. Hello. I'm calling out of Philadelphia. And um, first, I got to congratulate Joe for an excellent session. This is a wonderful way to think outside the box and truly learn something um, that, that does apply to us in our field and in our lives. Um, you know, this talk about CBD versus THC. Uh, I'm in southeast Pennsylvania. I live real close to Delaware. Um, I know that we can get, like, we get CBD in Delaware, and my husband uses it in a tincture. He's had two back surgeries, um, you know, in his early 20s, so, it's, you know, he's never going to be quite right from that. And it really helps uh, with the inflammation and back pain and spasms and that kind of thing. I've always been leery of CBD only because it seems too good to be true. Uh, you go to different you know, craft fairs or any vendor, and they list, it's, it's like snake oil. It cures everything. Hangnail, take CBD. You know, your hair not growing right, take CBD. You know, you blink too much, take CBD. <laughs> Is it really too good to be true, or does it really work this well? Yeah, you got to be careful about that. Now, you know, and, and I'm going to say something I said earlier. I don't think you can take CBD so eating hamburgers every day and think you'll live a long life and not exercise. You know, it, it's a lot of things playing the good health. It's not just one thing. However, with that said, uh, make no doubt about it, CBD, the right product, uh, does wonders. Now, snake oils, there could be some CBD snake oils out there, no doubt, no doubt about it. Matter of fact, I just read that people selling CBD doesn't even have CBD in the product. But they know it's a catchphrase right now for a lot of people, and they're looking for help. I mean, people are in trouble, they're hurting, they're in pain, arthritis, back surgery, whatever. Uh, they're, they, they're looking for something. So they're taking advantage of that. I wouldn't do that. There are some reputable companies out there who have the product. It's tested. It's shown that it actually have the CBD in the product. Uh, those are the ones I would be sort of gravitating to to purchase. Yeah, from a, from a, from a, um, a, a side show at a carnival, yeah, I wouldn't buy that CBD. That would not be well in the place I would get it from. Uh, sure. But... Uh, CBD, CBD by itself. Don't trust me. Go to the literature. Go. There's a there's a website called Project CBD. www.projectcbd. Go to that website. Search anything you want. High blood pressure, diabetes, uh, post traumatic stress. There'll be a litany of articles in there to support this product from reputable uh, medical schools and research facilities. You know. So don't be don't shy away from it because of the uh, uh, the power that it has. Now, hangnails is not gonna fix the hangnail, okay? <laughs> uh, but 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 there are uh, again a lot of disease processes that uh, are, are, are is benefiting from. Like now, now, one of the problems with the research in this again is that you research something that's illegal, and you don't get medical schools who get federal money wanting to do that. See, so it becomes a problem. Um, but the, the, the benefits of this product are enormous. Uh, and I got to tell you, again, I think in the next five to 10 years, if we ever get our politics straight, um, uh, you're going to see something wonderful. 
Well, I think CBD is definitely stuck in the catch-22 of they want to wait for research and proof before they approve it, but without the approval, it won't get the research and the proof. And so it just hangs in the balance. And, yeah. and you're, I think you're absolutely correct. And still, until the government gets on board, and I think people have to make this change, um, it's going to stay stuck there. And it's going to stay stuck there because some guy who ran the paper and wanted to cut down trees, which we already know is detrimental to the environment, um, instead of using this plant that's easily grown, easily cultivated, and has so many uses, until we change that, I, it's going to be a very slow movement. Now, in the yeah. first talk, and this is something that I could, I could talk all day about, is you know nicotine, smoking, um, and versus vaping. Um, well, you talked earlier about you know oxidization and using antioxidants, and how I, we all know how bad smoking cigarettes is for us. Is it the nicotine? Or is it, the, is it the lighting of a plant on fire and all the other things that go along with it? Yeah. Well, you know, the cigarette has two parts to it, right? It has the tars and nicotine. And what I tell my patients, the tars give you cancer, the nicotine gives you heart disease. So it's both products in that plant, in that product that does. Now, you know, the other things in cigarettes, too, and I wish I had a picture that I should have took a picture of that from my office. I have it for my patients. It shows in cigarettes, you can find arsenic, you can find formaldehyde, you can find carbon monoxide. All those are not good for you, obviously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a litany of things in a cigarette that's not good. It's not one thing, it's all of it. Now, Jennifer, are you, oh, one person, are you vaping? I, I did have one person. Yes, one I do. I, I quit smoking three years ago, and I, I did it by switching to, to vaping, and I've dropped my nicotine from 12 milligrams per mil to three. It's a very low amount of nicotine itself. Um, the The... Oh. Ingredients in total are propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, uh, flavoring, and then pharmaceutical grade nicotine. Um, I, I keep a pretty close watch on the white papers and the research coming out. And it's another one of those things that is uh, stuck in government and it's trapped in, in money. Um, you know, the government makes a lot of money from big tobacco uh, due to something called the mass settlement agreement uh, that took place, I guess, in the 80s, I want to say. And... Uh, you know, it funds, uh, tobacco funds a lot of uh, government projects, and if they lose that, they're screwed. Uh, and so they're trying to find a way uh, to gain that money back, and I, I don't really think the government wants people to quit smoking, quite frankly. Um, the research that I've done and that I've looked into and I keep track of uh, has definitely said that uh, nicotine is, isn't nearly as dangerous. It's addictive. Nicotine is absolutely addictive. So is caffeine. Um, but, you know, when you go to Starbucks, there is not a giant sign on the side of your latte that says uh, this product contains caffeine, a highly addictive chemical. Um, but mine does. I was just at a, a, a Sheets, a, a, basically a, a big gas station uh, the other day, and they had a couple of advertisements for some of the ENDS devices, some of the e-cigarette devices. And I think a good quarter of the advertisement was this warning saying that, you know, this contains nicotine, a highly addictive chemical. And just a few feet away is an advertisement for cigarettes. And the Surgeon General warning was this teeny tiny little fine print on the bottom um, that you couldn't see from where I was sitting, but I could obviously see this giant nicotine warning. And it's just, um, it's stuck, it's backwards, and it needs to be fixed. I agree. Now, I, I, I'm going to say something about the vaping. You know, the vaping thing came out with e-cigarettes to hopefully offset the, uh, the tars in the, in the cigarette. But the nicotine, the way I saw it, was used, it should, should have been used, or should be used as a way to wean yourself off of cigarettes altogether. While nicotine may not be as bad as you think, it's bad. You know, and it's going to cause some problems. It's going to oxidative problems, inflammation problems. It's going to cause some problems. Uh, it could be COPD or whatever, you're going to have some problems. So the best thing, use that product as a way to wean yourself off of nicotine and tobacco products all together. Not as a step down, a step completely away from it so you don't have it in your system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, because I've, I've, I've been off cigarettes completely for three years. No, no combustibles whatsoever. And like I said, I've, I've dropped my nicotine level. Uh, greatly, because you know, I, you you mentioned that you're addicted is what it is. You are, and you're not just addicted to nicotine. There's a ritual. Um, anybody who has a habit like this will tell you there's a ritual of purchasing the cigarettes, of how you pack them, how you open them, when you light them on your drive to work. There's an entire 
ritual, a hand to mouth that you have to break. And it's very difficult. Um, and patches and gum and medications with side effects don't replace that. Yeah. And you're absolutely correct about that. You know, one of the things that people don't realize, one of the reasons they put menthol in cigarettes because they wanted to make it more tolerant for women. So menthol cigarettes really put that for ladies to get addicted, and it certainly got them addicted. So, Roger, did you have, did you, did you have any questions? Uh, so, okay, so, Dr. Jones, let me ask you this, if I can. Is THC beneficial? So you talked about hemp, you talked about marijuana, that we're talking about hemp and high concentration of cannabinoid versus marijuana, high concentration of THC. But is there benefit to the THC and marijuana Maybe not in the same way, but in a different way. Yes, that's the question. Yes, <clears throat> and the way it comes to kind of make up nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy, the TAC is official in that. Okay. Oh, hold it's on, your also your connection is going down. Uh, try that. Say that again, Doc. Your connection was weak. Uh, I was saying yes to the answer. Does TAC have some medical benefits? Yes, mainly with like. Like nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy, as mm -hmm. well as, um, and this is still being researched, okay, high doses in people who have cancer. Okay? Mm -hmm. People who have cancer. So in those two instances, yes, it does have some benefit. Mm -hmm. So do the cannabinoids have enough THC, does the hemp have enough THC in it to make it illegal for the uh, for people to drive, for people to go to work? Are you going to test positive for THC? You know what? That's interesting. That just came like the last few days, Joe. It turns out that um, most uh, municipalities or state or federal uh, drug testing for THC really encompasses a cannabis check. So what happens is that you, uh -huh. you, you see you take CBD, okay? Uh, and you take the urine test, it's going to test positive for cannabis. And now you're in a quandary. But it's not really THC. So you have to request, check me for THC. Okay? To check you with THC if you're taking pure CBD. And you can take pure CBD that does not have any THC in it. Okay? Or you should be negative for THC. And that's the thing. Unfortunately, still in some areas, CBD is still classified as a class one substance in the... Um, uh, 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 Controlled substance act, uh, and you're still in trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. As a recent, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, the DA in one county in Florida says he's going to be raiding stores that sell in CBD. So you have to be careful about this. We have a lot of legal things to overcome. Uh, I guess, fortunately, here in Louisiana, we just um, had our two large universities, Southern University and LSU systems, given the permission to start growing marijuana to use in dispensaries around the state. However, only for those patients who have a certain number of diseases for which it can be beneficial as well as getting it prescribed by a doctor of the state who has a um, certificate for prescribing marijuana. Wow. So it's still gonna be somewhat restricted. It's gonna be restricted, but it's on the way. That's a, that's a move forward, um, but we got a long way to go. Roger? Roger, come over here, Roger. I mean, you're in the studio, so you may as well come over here. All That's right. good. All right, I'll go Just right next to right you. Stand right here beside me. All right. Dr. Jones, I have a question yes. for you. Would there, is there a difference between um, smoking marijuana? I'm sure there is. Between smoking marijuana and actually making, like, like using it in food or making, making things like that? Like, is He's a brownie eater, Doc. He, he eats brownies. Yeah. Yeah. He's My an artist. Is long, yeah. You get a serum concentration of THC up to a certain level, you have the same effects you get when you smoke it as when you eat it. And it's still the THC. So um, the answer to that question is really uh, probably in the long run, no big difference between the two. It's I'm an avenue of getting to your body. I mean, more, more towards like the, I guess, I, I'm sure smoking it, obviously you're smoking and, and it's smoking is like a lot worse for you. So the, the lung complications that can occur from smoking the marijuana versus eating it. So, you know, he wants to get high. So is he going to get high without being, without the negative effects uh, of, on the lungs if he eats it versus smokes it? 
Yeah, well, again, now we're not promoting, we're not promoting THC as a, as a recreational thing. You know, we talk about the beneficial medical side of it. Um, again, my understanding, and again, I've been mainly with CBD, is that the avenue in which you get THC in your body really doesn't make much difference. You might have a quick onset if you smoke in it. I don't know. But you're going to still get a buzz from eating it, too, whether it be brownies or edibles or whatever. Again, but I got to tell you, again, be very careful that these things aren't really regulated yet. And you're going to get all kind of funguses and stuff in those things as you uh, look at edibles. So make sure you get in a reputable place you get those things from. And that obviously it's legal uh, that you're doing. He's probably growing it and, and, and <laughs> making it himself. But, but it, you're not answering the question, though, is, is the, are, do, you, do you have n the same negative effects to your lungs COPD, uh, emphysema, so forth, from yeah. smoking it versus eating it. Well, you know, they don't have tars and nicotine. So you're not getting tars and nicotine, the, the real culprits in the, the, the tobacco plant, okay? So you're not going to get that. I'll tell you a story I heard the other day. There's a lady who had asthma who uh, was on three medicines, and the doctor wanted to put on a fourth medicine. And she heard about vaping CBD. You mm -hmm. can vape CBD. She started vaping CBD She's off all her medicines. She, she never was breathing better in a long time. Wow. So we're vaping CBD, okay? And that can be done too. Uh, it's not THC, it's CBD. Right, right. So, yeah, it's a you know, that plant is different. Mm -hmm. So, Jennifer, you were trying to add something Thank you very to much, this? doctor. Thank well, you. It, yeah, I'm just, I'm really glad that question got asked because um, that's, what it's, you know, the, a lot of the terminology and the information you get um, when you try to do research, because it can be difficult because a lot of it's tainted or swayed uh, one way or the other, is the idea, it's like, okay, smoking is bad, and it's, it's, it's the nicotine, and, which I don't agree with, um, as, as it's the tar, obviously, and it's the act of... It's, <laughs> Jennifer, you can't, you can't simply I, disagree with it because it I doesn't fit your narrative. You can't do that, Okay. Did you not just disagree with Dr. Badia last night? That's different. And that's different. I disagree oh, with everything. I disagree with everything he says, but that's because oh, I have okay. to. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, well, I like again. I, I will definitely keep up on the research on it, but for the moment, my jury is out. Let's say that. All right. Fair um, enough. But the idea that you know, uh, pot never kills anybody. Never ever died, died from an overdose of THC or, or from smoking pot. And it's always amazing to me that um, obviously igniting a marijuana plant has been around for a very long time and that they don't have emphysema and they don't have uh, COPD and they don't have lung cancer from that. Uh, it has always sort of amazed me. So I was glad to hear, you know, him speak on that. Um, vaping CBD can happen. Um, it's hard to get. And also to the point of testing positive, uh, Dr. Jones is, is obviously very correct about testing positive for cannabis and they don't differentiate between the two. But it's also going to depend on, again, getting a qualified supplier for CBD to make sure that it's pure enough that it has, it should be, I think it's like a less than, is it less than 3% or something like that THC in it? It's, it's a very, very uh, negligible yeah. amount of THC in it, not enough to um, obviously get you high and not long enough to stay in your system uh, to test positive for it. Yeah, it's, it's, less than, it's less than 0.3%. 0.3. 0.3. I knew there was a three in there. Point three. Yeah. So that's pretty low. That's very, very low. Yeah. I was yeah. only off by a hundredth. That's all right. <laughs> no problem. You know, hey, look, what, P, PO2 was 30, PO2 was 100. What's the difference? Yeah. yeah but as long as you're still, standing 100, it doesn't really matter. That's right. But still, if you, that point three can still test positive. That's right. People... And that's, that's the big problem. But well, well be, if you read the Control Substance Act, it's supposed to be legal if you get the the, uh, the CBD from the stalk of a mature plant and the TC level is less than 0.3%. That's supposed to be legal. Okay. But most law enforcement don't know the law. And then you got to defend yourself. you guilty until proven innocent. That's right. That is right. We say otherwise, but that's not really true. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, not, listen. Not in practice. Jennifer, listen, thank you so much. Dr. Jones, I want to thank you very much. Lively conversation. And uh, I can see you're probably getting called by the hospital, having run back there. You're just down the street from it. And uh, so in yeah. deference to your busy schedule, I just want to, on behalf of everybody that was watching this evening and will watch the program later as well, 
I want to thank you for taking your, uh, your very limited time to come talk to us about this uh, very important topic. Well, thank you, Joe. And I just want to leave one, one, one last statement, too, is that we have to take these matters into our own hand with your help. You just can't depend on somebody to lead you down the primrose path where you're going to be healthy, whether it be exercising, whether it be choosing the right things at the grocery store, whether it be supporting legislation on CBD. You know, we have to take things into our own hands uh, because it's your health that's at, at, at risk. Um, and uh, if you want to know uh, how you can't buy health, and uh, it's better to stay healthy than to get sick and get healthy again. Uh oh, something just happened. Up, oh, you're there. You are. Yep. So basically, I, I think what you're saying, Dr. Jones, is is that it is it's it's personal conduct, it's personal responsibility, and uh, you know we have to we have to take care of ourselves, whether it's diet, whether it's exercise, lifestyle, whatever the situation may be, we're, we we have to start being per more personally responsible. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and uh, Jennifer closed out with a quick uh, comment to you that said, after this, she's going to quit her job, herd sheep, grow hemp, and uh, take quality vitamins. So you certainly impacted somebody's life directly tonight. That's for sure. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, Doc. Take care of yourself. Be safe. And once again, thank you, everyone. Our next program is scheduled for June the 8th. It's a Saturday program, so it'll be good for five CEUs, and I'm going to look forward to seeing everybody then. Remember to subscribe. Remember to do the notifications so that if we decide to add something on, I'd really like to do a series with Dr. Jones on this topic and have it really develop into a uh, group of people to expand this. Because like you said, we have to take it upon ourselves. Well, if, we, if, if you were to keep talking about this, you and others, through this medium that we have here, I, I, I think that that's part of the solution that you're referring to. So, you know, you're eloquent when it comes to this topic, and uh, uh, I think you speak to it uh, very, very authoritatively and enjoyably and knowledgeably, and I think that uh, our community really needs to have more voices like yourself. I appreciate it, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, everybody. Good night.